is the Amiga 500. In the last episode of the Amiga Tower, we added a reset switch and an external keyboard connector to connect to an um, Amiga 2000 or 3000 keyboard. In this episode, we are taking this Amiga 500 to the next level. We will add a Pi Storm. The Pi Storm is a small board that connects to a Raspberry Pi 3. And this board sits on top of the Pi. And this board gets plugged in the socket of the 68000. So it basically emulates a 68000. This is still under development. So um, whenever you watch this video, there may be major improvements and you can flash this um, CPLD, which is on here. So what are PALs, CPLDs and FPGAs anyway? You may have heard that computers work in zeros and ones. While not completely wrong, it is simplified. Correct is, computers work, much like humans, in highs and lows. Low being usually zero volts and high being usually between three and five volts. To do anything useful with a computer, that doesn't help much. You can basically say on or off. Long before a computer like we know and love was created, there was an English bloke by the name of George Boole. Sounds familiar? That's because he is the inventor of the so-called Boolean logic and Boolean algebra. So what is Boolean logic, you might ask? Simply said, it's what makes computers useful. Boolean logic at its core consists of three concepts. And, or, and not. Combine that with the binary system of 0 and 1, standing in for low and high, and you get what the pros call the primitive logic gates, which is pretty much what a computer, even today, consists of. The simplest of the primitive logic gates is the NOT gate. If you input 1 or high, it outputs 0 or low, and if you input 0 or low, it outputs 1 or high. It just negates the input. Every logic gate has one or more inputs and one output. The end gate is a bit more complex. It has two inputs and one output. Whenever the two inputs are one, the output is one, else the output is zero. The OR gate has two inputs and one output. Whenever one of the inputs is one, the output is one, else the output is zero. To explain what a PAL, a CPLD and an FPGA is, we have to go still a little deeper. Enter composite gates. Composite gates are groups of other primitive or composite gates. Think of a gate as a Lego brick. By putting different Lego bricks together, you get a more complex build. That can again be used to build even more complex builds. If, for example, you wanted to have an end gate with three inputs, you could put the first two inputs into a simple end gate and the output of that end gate together with a third input into a second end gate. If all three inputs are one, the output is one, else the output is zero. That is the expected result. Any composite logic gate can be viewed from two different perspectives, the inner and the outer. The inner perspective are the different chained together logic gates that make up the composite gate, while the external view just shows the number of inputs and outputs. That brings us to PALs, CPLDs and FPGAs. A PAL or programmable array logic is the most simple PLD or programmable logic device. It's pretty much an IC with input and output pins. Inside that IC are a number of end gates as an array that the input can be connected to. Groups of those end gates are then fed to one of the OR gates, which also form an array. The outputs of the OR gates can then either be picked up on the output pins or it can be fed to an internal flip-flop called an output macro cell. Simplified, a flip-flop or a macro cell is a storage that can either hold a 1 or a 0, so it's kind of a memory. PAL is basically a semi-pre-configured composite gate. Semi because the ORs are hardwired and only the ends are configurable. 
The CPLD, or Complex Programmable Logic Device, is like the PAL, but it has usually much more inputs and outputs and the OR gates are also user configurable. The CPLD that runs the Amiga Pi Storm, for example, is an Altera Max 2 EPM570. If we take a look at the datasheet, we see that this specific CPLD has 440 macro cells, which are the storage units, and 160 I.O. pins. It even comes with some flash memory on board. So in order to create the Pi Storm, its creator set out to recreate the Motorola 68000 CPU with the logic gates inside of that Altera Max 2. So what is the difference to emulation? Emulation takes some electronic logic and tries to recreate it using software. What a CPLD or an FPGA does is that it allows you to recreate electronic logic with kind of an electronic logic breadboard. It is still electronic, it's not software. It needs no software to run to do its job and as this, it can be 100% accurate. So what's an FPGA now? Well, PALs and CPLDs are all nice and good, but due to the relatively few inputs and outputs and the small number of storage flip-flops, you can only come that far in terms of complex designs. Enter the FPGA, a highly advanced custom IC that can be completely configured by the user, has more memory and can be configured through software from the outside. The most popular languages for that being Verilog or VHDL. While it's still configured by software, its logic runs electronically. As you can see, this is not emulation. Let's just say it's kind of hardware in software. So in order to put all this into the Amiga, we first have to prepare the Raspberry Pi. We have to prepare an SD card, already slotted one in here. Um, put on the Raspberry Pi OS Lite version, which boots much quicker without any GUI. Um, then we have to fit all this into the machine and have to set up the Pi Storm to work inside the Amiga. So there's a whole slew of stuff that you can do with this and we are only just getting started. So let's do this. In order to install the Raspberry Pi OS, you simply head over to the Raspberry Pi website, click on software, click on Raspberry Pi OS. So if you click on Raspberry Pi Imager up here, which is a method I use usually, um, you download the Raspberry Pi Imager and that can be downloaded for Mac OS, Windows or Ubuntu and you select the one you like. And I already did that. So here's the Raspberry Pi Imager. And what you do is you select the Raspberry Pi OS, but you go on other and there you select light. You select your SD card, which is already inserted into the PC or your Mac, not the Raspberry Pi, because how should that work? So put it into the PC or the Mac you are on right now, select it and select right. And say yes. I need to get my password here. And away we write. That goes reasonably fast, but I will fast forward this. Okay, and the install is done. You can now take out the SD card and plug it in the Raspberry Pi. And the next step is to install the Pi 3, the SD card, and the Pi Storm inside the A500. And we will do just that. Okay, here's the SD card. We will just plug this into the Pi, like this. That's in there. And now let's open up the Amiga and put in this contraption. And what we need to do now is the 68000 sits right here. And this Pi Storm module goes in here. You just have to check that way. So the notch is down here. And you have to connect, let me quickly see, I guess like this, but this doesn't work. 
So it has to go like this, I assume. It's possible that I have to desolder the USB ports, but I don't think so. Hmm. Okay, next day, or even three days, got this from AZ Delivery, which is a brand that is sold on Amazon in Germany. And this is a, G a GPIO relocator board. So I uh, found this. It's the only thing I could find. Already put some electrical tape down here. And we just put this on here. And then we can use the Raspberry Pi 3 model B+. This sits nice on here. And then we put the Pi Storm up against this and it has to sit yeah, like this. So I might put some electrical tape down here because hmm, that's not ideal. Okay, so that's on. And then we go and put this on here. Nice. So that's our Pi Storm. And this has to go into the Amiga. I guess the notch is down here. So let's open this up. And let's lift out the 68,000 out of its socket. Okay, nice. And now let's put in the Pi Storm like this. So the HDMI port goes to the right side. So the problem with this relocator board is that the Pi is way too high to close the case. But that is not a problem in our case, haha, because we are putting this in a tower. So no problem here. Okay, so next thing to do is, SD card is already in, um, attach an HDMI cable and boot the Amiga and see what happens. If we see a rainbow uh, on the screen, not uh, shitted out by an unicorn, then we are good. Okay, we're all set. Let's fire it up. Uh, it's not quite a rainbow. Looks a bit reddish. And the Amiga doesn't look too happy. Ah, it did switch to external. That is the problem here. And there's the Pi. Whew! Okay, she might. So, so I could have looked for the fault for hours here. Good thinking, man. Good thinking. For once you used your head. Nice. Okay, and there we have a login. Nice. So this is the light version. So there's no GUI, but um, just a login and Ah, I forgot, we have to attach a keyboard because this Amiga keyboard won't work here. I have the official Raspberry Pi keyboard here. Of course, use any keyboard you like. Plug that in, see if it works. So the username is Pi. The password is Raspberry. And that should log us in and you see we are not logged in and that is because this is a German keyboard. So if you are not using a German or a US keyboard or a British keyboard, um, you will have to press that instead of Y. So again, the login is Pi and the password is Raspberry in my case, Raspberry in all the other cases. And there we are. We have root access. And uh, I have to check what to do now. Yeah, so I used my Raspberry Pi keyboard. You can use, of course, any USB keyboard you like. So next you type in sudo raspi. Oh man. Config. And here you go to display options and you set a specific screen resolution and you use 1280 by 720. Then you go to uh, localization options, I guess. 
and you set your wireless LAN country, which is nowhere to be found. That is okay. Um, then you set, we just the system options, wireless LAN, and you use your uh, SSID minus Arschclown, which means as clown in German. And I will not tell you what my password is. And that should set the wireless LAN or Wi Fi. And then you enable um, SSH on boot. Let me quickly check. No, it's not here. Um, I guess it's interface options exactly and you go to SSH and you enable it and now you can SSH or secure shell from your Windows or Mac PC um, to the Raspberry Pi when it's started and we exit this do you like to reboot now Okay, so there's the rainbow, nice. And now we have a smaller screen resolution and so we can see better what's happening here. So after the, re the reboot, we again can, it can SSH from the PC or uh, the Mac or we do it on the Pi directly. I will do it on the Pi directly. So the login again is Pi password is still raspberry and we have root access and we say sudo apt dash get update man then we type sudo apt get full upgrade and that will indeed load the latest OS version if there's one do you want to continue yes Now we go and build the Raspberry Pi, uh, the PyStorm package and for that we need a library and we type sudo apt get install git libra sound to dash dev Okay, that wasn't found. Oh, it's Libra sound, not Libra sound. My mistake. No, oh, that's better. Do you want to continue? Yes, please. Next up, we have to clone the Git repository in which the PyStorm development happens right now. And for that, we type git clone http ps slash github.com slash captain dash amygdala no. Slash man pi storm dot git. See? And it works. Nice. So this is copying the git repository to our local machine. Then we say cd pi storm and change into the directory we just downloaded and say make, which is a make file 
which then compiles and creates the actual software in the latest version, I guess. Okay, that seems to have worked. No errors, just a few warnings, which is not unusual. Next, we have to update um, the CPLD inside the PyStorm module. And for that, we say sudo apt get install open o CD and we want to continue, yes. So again we are downloading files and then we go and type dot man forward slash flash dot sh which is a shell script which should then update or flash the cpld okay cpld is flashed that's pretty much it so let's start the emulator or the pystorm we have to do this manually right now we will do this in a minute uh, so that it always if the pi starts starts automatically but let's do this now and say sudo dot forward slash emulator minus minus config amiga dot cfg. No, oh, and the amiga came to life. So let's quickly change the channel here to ext and we should see the Amiga boot screen and there it is. Nice. Cool. So that worked very good and it worked out of the box so there's nothing strange or complicated about it just a few commands to set and um, for once something worked out of the box which is quite nice <laughs> to tell the truth after the last project I had here uh, which gave me quite some headache. Okay so we have a basic setup and the PyStorm is running inside the Amiga. Before you head over to your PC log into the Raspberry Pi again from your keyboard and I guess I typed that wrong. And you do of course need uh, an IP address to SSH and FTP too. So you type hostname dash uh, space dash and then a big I. And that should give you the IP address right here. Write that down and then you're good to go and uh, FTP or SSH to your Pi. Just a quick note before we head over to the PC. You can now, if you want, and if you do what I do from the PC or the Mac, you can now disconnect the keyboard and you can disconnect the HDMI cable. Um, and you can then, and that is very important, restart the Amiga and it will boot to a red screen, which is completely normal if there's no CPU present. Um, and that starts the Pi. So the Pi has to have power and that power comes from the Amiga. So you have to start the Amiga before you can SSH or secure shell to the Pi from your PC. Doesn't work anywhere else because the Pi has no power, the Pi, Pi is not started and so you can't connect to it. Um, if you don't have Wi-Fi you can also connect a normal um, network cable that works also. So let's head over to the PC and uh, do the configuration shenanigans. So first let's open a shell window like this and then let's SSH to the Pi by typing SSH minus L Pi and then the IP address of your Pi 
and the password is raspberry still. And here we are. And there are two methods to auto start the um, Pi. And the first would be to simply start it after the Pi has booted. And that is the simple method, which only requires one line of code or shell script. Um, but we will go the a little bit more complicated route because that way we can start the Pi much earlier or the emulator much earlier um, by just using a service. And we have to prepare the service and stuff like that. And we will do this now. So first, let's check where we are. Um, and never mind, I already created some files. We will use these later. Yes, we will first get root access by typing sudo su minus. Then we will go and create a new file. And to do that, we type sudo nano slash lib slash system systemd slash system slash pystorm dot service man I'm trying to type around a microphone here so it's a bit hard and there we type all of this so unit description start pystorm uh -huh. and we exit this by typing control x and y for yes and that saves the file and it does offer us the name which is correct and we just press enter and that should have created the file now um, we create a shell script so so this was a service description so if we start the pi storm as a service um, it gets started much earlier in the process of booting the pi and what we do now is we make a, sh a shell script which we can call um, to actually start the service and we will do this now and for that we go to home pi we are not to go there here we say sudo nano nano is the text editor and sudo is used to be the super user which is a little bit obsolete right now because we are root already but still doing this um, and we want to create a file that's called start emulator.sh and in there we type this and this does not much it just tells um, the machine that this is an executable shell script cds to home pi pystorm and starts the emulator script and again we type control x y enter and that is that and if we look here we should have the file which is start emulator and to make this um, executable we have to type chmod 755 slash home slash pi slash start emulator dot sh this changes the security settings of the shell script this start emulator.sh so that we can um, execute it. Next up, we have to um, reload the daemon file, which stores all the system services. And for that, we say system control daemon dash reload done. And then we enable the service Again, with system control enable pi storm pi storm dot service, and now the service is active, and we can restart the service by system control restart. PyStorm, which restarts the service. And if you take a look at your Amiga now, it should have booted. So it should show you the kickstart um, disk. 
Let me quickly show you. So now if I switch off the Amiga and switch it on again, and the Pi should load and the Amiga should start. Let's see if this works. And there we go. That took a few seconds. You have to check if there's a faster method, but still okay. So you won't have to do this too often. We still have our reset switch here, so let's push this and see what happens. Oh, look at that. Reset works. Nice. So next up we could switch the CPU and change this to a six, uh, 68 or 30 and uh, add another kickstart ROM. Or okay, next up we open a fresh terminal window and SSH to the Pi again. Make sure that the Pi is still running. Um, and the password is the Raspberry, which of course I did type wrong. Now the first thing we do is copy the standard config file to make sure that it um, doesn't get destroyed through our doings. And for that we first say make dear or mk dear amiga dash files. And he says cannot create because I already have this, but you should do this. And you can see right here is my amiga files directory. Then we copy the config file here by typing uh, I storm slash amiga dot cfg and a dot at the end. And as you can see, here's my amiga dot cfg file, which is the config file we will be using. And then we kill the emulator and that will stop the Amiga. So MU later and then we stop the service system control stop high storm and then we edit the service file that we or the service script that we created before. So we say sudo nano um, slash home slash man slash pi slash drip start emulator dot sh. And that is the file we created before. And here we now add minus minus config dot dot slash amiga.cfg and that is the configuration file we just copied. We press Control X, Y, Enter and that should be saved and we can restart the Pi by sudo system control start pystorm. We have an amiga.cfg file, let's open this and for that we say sudo nano amiga.cfg and let's take a look. So if we scroll through this we can see a lot of stuff in here and right now the CPU which is the first thing we have set is 68020 and you can see here are the available values which are okay so I guess we will go with an uh, 68030 for now. That's nice. Um,
Next question is which kickstart ROM to use. So there is a kick ROM um, in right here and it's a kickstart 1.3 I guess which is the default for the Amiga 500 but there were some with a 1.2 kickstart ROM. Um, to change that you have to load a kickstart ROM onto the Pi um, using SFTP which we can do in a minute and then you have to specify which kickstart file to use here but we will not do this now we'll come back to this in a minute and we can also add additional memory here 128 megabyte of ram then we have the whole pi scuzzy thing um, and this seems to map to pystorm.hdf so if we load workbench we should actually see this hard disk file haven't tried this yet so that seems to be this seems to come pre-installed with some um, drivers and utilities interesting and it's uh, mapped to SCSI drive number six so we can map our own files here but again we have to create an hdf file and upload it to the pi before we can do this Ah, okay, we can swap an external drive to DF0 just in software. That's nice if you would like to do that. And we can also, if we have the ECS Agnes 3872 and we have a trapdoor memory expansion of 12, uh, 512K, we can um, map that to chip RAM, which is nice because then we have more chip RAM and... Um, I'm not quite sure. Normally you have to do a, a hardware mod for that. Not sure if this simply works. And I don't have a memory expansion right now, so I guess we will leave that out for now. Okay, so I guess the next thing to do would be to change the kickstart ROM. Let's do this now. And for that we need um, an FTP client and I have FileZilla here and to actually connect to the Pi with this you have to create a new server use the SFTP protocol the server is the IP of your Pi and the password uh, username is Pi and the password is still Raspberry. And if you click connect, then you are on the Pi. Here are our Amiga files we just created, our start emulator sh, our um, config file which is still opened in the secure shell. And what we want to do is to copy a fresh kickstart ROM to the Amiga files directory. So I have to grab a kickstart ROM for that. And you can buy these for pretty cheap if you um, buy the Cluanto set on the Android phone. I guess this is 99 cents and you get the uh, fully licensed Kickstart ROMs and Workbench and all that stuff. Um, if you already have a Kickstart ROM, good for you. Just use that and um, we will just copy them over. And I have a kickstart 1.2 for the Amiga 500, kickstart 1.3 for the Amiga 2000. And I will do, this is I guess the 1.3 for the 3000. So we will call this, um, call this kick 1.3 3000 and that is the A1200 3.1 and I guess we will use this one with PyStorm. And 3.1, 1200, exactly. So let's copy this name and let's try if we can just put this in the config file. And for that we Scroll to the kick, kick ROM up here. 
file is Amiga files, which is the folder where we stored the file in, and then kick um, 311200.rom, and we just leave the rest for now. Control X, Y, Enter, and we restart. And that didn't do much. On my Amiga, I still have Kickstart 1.3, so that didn't work. Um, what could be the problem? Let me quickly check. So I just uh, moved over to the Amiga files directory and just saw that there's actually a kick with, a, with an uppercase K. And uh, since Unix or Mac OS or whatever um, is K sensitive, that might be the fault. So let me quickly correct that by just giving this an uppercase K. Seems to default back to 1.3 if that is not uh, correct. So let's restart. And now I do indeed have a 3.1 kickstart. Let me show you. So I did put in a workbench 3.1 disk. Let's check if this loads and if it works. Okay, it did load the workbench. But, oh, that's nice. There's our 128 megabytes of memory. Not sure about the real-time clock. Go check this out. Let me quickly set the time here. Yeah, see, it actually takes the time from the Pi. So the real-time clock is activated. That is the correct time and date. Nice, that works. I guess in the next episode we will do the hard disk file and we will do the Picasso graphics and uh, then we should uh, put all this into the tower case. Nice. So, see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Retro is the New Black. If you are new to the channel, please like and subscribe. If you like the video, please share. Every like, share and comment helps a lot. Until next time, bye bye.